right, we are going to turn into our Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to go to Matthew 22 and uh, go to verse number 15 as we uh, continue in our uh, lectionary passages, uh, appreciating certainly that we have uh, a great gift in the biblical text, particularly when the text speaks uh, to the times that we're in. Uh, it makes it so much easier for me as a preacher to uh, imagine what uh, God would have us to know or to hear on this day. And so Matthew 22, these are some of the last experiences of Jesus, some of his last teachings, his last sayings as he makes his way to uh, the Golgotha Hill, Calvary, uh, the cross. Uh, Jesus is continuing to download to his disciples some of his most important and final ideas uh, to remind them of their great call to go and tell and spread and preach the good news uh, to the world, to literally all of creation. And if you are a student of the Bible, you know that Matthew uh, has written his gospel with the Jewish audience in mind, that Matthew has uh, at his core uh, the desire to continue to prove to the disciples that he is indeed uh, writing about the Jesus of uh, the, the prophesied one, the Messiah that uh, would come and literally restore uh, the kind of promise that many Jews were hoping for, a promise of salvation and liberation. And so Matthew is attempting to uh, tell these kinds of stories and experiences in a way to help the Jewish people know that you don't have to keep looking for a Messiah because the Messiah has come. But if you're like me and if you're like them, we often are looking for Messiahs that look more like us than the Messiahs that we need. I wish I could talk to somebody in here who can be honest about how sometimes we can look for the Messiahs that look like us, that sound like us, that uh, re-inscribe uh, and, and reinforce what we know or think to be true versus the Messiah that we need, the Savior that we need. Do I have any witnesses out here that can say, God, I thank you that you sent me the Savior that I needed and not the Savior that I thought I wanted? Oh, my. All right. All right. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 15. And, and the scripture simply says like this. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. Verse 16. So they sent their disciples to Jesus along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality. Isn't it interesting that the arch nemesis of Jesus, the, the adversaries, the antagonists, the, the career-long uh, opposers of Jesus' ministry, send some of their disciples or followers to try and flatter Jesus with words to set him up as the scripture would say, I mean, this ain't part of my message per se, but you ought to be very, very suspicious of people who come on behalf of your enemies and they start with compliments. Hmm. Yes. All right. Amen. It's like, oh, I think I won them over. No, I don't think you've won them over. I think they got a trick up their sleeve. Verse uh, 17. They say, tell us then, Jesus, what you think. Is it lawful? to pay taxes to the emperor or not. But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why are you putting me to that test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought Jesus a denarius. Verse 20, then Jesus said to them, whose head is this and whose title is this? And verse 21 says, they answered the emperors or Caesars. And then Jesus said to them, give therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God's. Uh, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. So we're going to uh, speak from the topic today. These bros ain't loyal. 
These bros, they're not loyal. Y'all know it to be the truth. Amen. Come on, bow your heads with me and let's take a few moments to pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. May the people of the way say amen. Amen. Again, these bros ain't loyal. You ought to tap, put that in the chat and just remind yourself, I got some folk in my life and they, show sure enough, ain't loyal. Amen. They ain't loyal. They ain't loyal. Uh, the great urban prophet of our time, uh, Kendrick Lamar, he starts off uh, his uh, historic uh, record, uh, the, the, the rhyme on his, uh, on his uh, latest uh, record, uh, simply says, I got loyalty and royalty inside my DNA. Cocaine quarter piece got war and peace inside my DNA. I got power, poison, and joy inside my DNA. I got hustle, though ambition flow, inside my DNA. Kendrick Lamar, uh, I think, captures so powerfully uh, the, the nature of one of our greatest challenges. That is to come to grips with that which constitutes us and also to continue to wrestle with that which forms us. That which constitutes us and that which forms us, meaning that we are all products of a story. We are products of a narrative, a set of historical events and lineages that we did not get to choose. That these stories and these narratives, these historical events and lineages, they pre-produce a version of who you are. Amen. That some of that is, is literally coded within your DNA. Additionally, we can't escape the impact that the realities we are born into, the choices we will make, and the ideas and the people who will form us, they produced a kind of post-production version of you. So we have a pre-production version that is about what constitutes us, and we have a post-production version that is deeply formed and shaped by that which we experience. And how many of you know that this process of being produced or formed, or dare I say transformed, means that you will show up in the image and likeness of some kind of external influence. It is my hope that we here at The Way, we who follow the ways of Jesus, will make it a priority to be transformed into the image and the likeness of the one who is our Savior. The one who has demonstrated from eternity up until now the commitment to ensure our best in this life and the life to come. But it is also clear to me that the pre-produced version of us the pre-produced version of us, that which constitutes us, has already been influenced by both the divine and human forces at work. For we are all created in the image of God, and we bear the likeness of our parents or our progeny. That we don't just pop out and just all of a sudden look totally different than that those who produced us. I mean, there may be some variances, praise God. I mean, there may be some things that, that, that don't uh, make you all the way alike, but you know, for the most part, you can look at somebody and be like, oh yeah, y'all, y'all family. Y'all got the same nose, you got the same ears, you got the same eyes, you got the same bad attitude. Oh yeah, y'all family, praise God, right? But it is always important to know that the pre-produced version of us may indeed have the influences of the divine and the human, but the post-produced version of us, i.e. that which is forming you and I, 
it also has the possibilities of both human and divine influence. And the question for us is, will we find ourselves surrendering to the divine influence or overtaken by the influence of fallen creation all around us? You see, what I want you to appreciate this morning, no doubt about it, that the influence or formation that is at work around us every day, in times of our crises, in times of our, our ups or in times of our downs, in times of our triumphs and in times of our defeat, those things that are influencing us, they are forming us with the ability or the inability to diagnose the vices that may be at work in our lives. And for some of us, we find it difficult to identify and diagnose the things that influence us. And so we float through life and we take it all in and we assume that we are independent thinkers. Anybody ever met these kind of folk, a man who, who just assume that, you know, I am an independent thinker and I, I make my own uh, conclusions and, and I'm so smart and wise that, that, that I, I just think up these ideas and, or I can discern every bit of information uh, with infallibility. Not appreciating that you are under the influence of anonymous forces at times. Forces that you and I are not fully appreciative or aware of until it is brought to our attention. I mean, just think of how social media is influencing us. And unless you really study the algorithms and the ways in which people are manipulating the things that come across your timeline, you would think that it is by divine intervention that the same person keeps popping up on your feed. But could it be that somebody else who is anonymous to you, oh my God, has figured out a way to influence your mind, to influence your heart? I am stunned and I am dismayed by the ways in which people can be so conscious of one thing, yet so willfully obtuse to another, until I look in the mirror. <laughs> And then I see my own contradictions and my own complicities. Then I ask God for mercy. I ask God for repentance. I ask God for correction. I want you to know, child of God, that there's a lot at stake when you allow anonymous influences to lay claim to our loyalty and misinform us in ways that deform us as we journey towards a path of transformation. You and I must be very clear that that which we are loyal to, if it is not true, it deforms, meaning it literally unravels the forming of your transformation into the image of Jesus. And that's why we have to learn to be intentional about that which we allow to form us. Woe unto you who cannot see how misinformation is literally deforming or breaking down our imago dei. That part of us that is actually a reflection of the divine work of God in our lives. Woe to you who cannot see how the deforming of us is literally trying to reform you after the likeness of a Caesar who asks for your loyalty even when they are not capable of being loyal to you in return. Lord, I, I, I don't know if you you, you, you you aware of the Caesars that work in your life. Amen. Those, those, those kind of people who are always asking for your loyalty even though they cannot reciprocate it. That's why I, I, I say these bros ain't loyal because they are always asking of you that which they have proven to you to be incapable of returning. 
You've been in, 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 in relationships. You've been in projects. You've been on jobs. You've been in class. You, you've been in spaces with people who are unable to reciprocate that which they ask of us. And this is why it is so important for you and I, if I must be loyal to anyone or anything, God, may it not be the loyalty to the Caesars of this world. But my prayer is for me, and my prayer is for you. My prayer is for us to be loyal to the God of history, who was made flesh in the life of Jesus and has been active in creation through the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost. God, help me to remain loyal to you. And may I be beware of these bros out here that ain't loyal and that are making every effort to cause me to, to slice and splice, to split and to fragment my loyalty to the God who throughout the history and the course of time has demonstrated God's great loyalty. Or if I use a better theological word, God's faithfulness. Oh, the scripture says, great is thy faithfulness. Oh, God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. All I have need, your hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, how many are glad that every morning you get a new, a new round of God's faithfulness? Here, child of God, I want to now look at the text and compare and contrast how the bros that ain't loyal do not deserve your time, nor do they deserve the influence they seek in your life. And you and I must now make some decisions about the God that is faithful. And how much time will I give the God that is faithful time and opportunity in my life? Just last week, I think, I preached last week. I can't remember all oh, these weeks they, they, they blend in together. But I know if it wasn't last week, it was the week before, we talked about the, the number of thoughts that are in our mind. And that every day we can average about 50,000 thoughts per day. And I wonder how many of your thoughts are you giving to those who aren't loyal? Verses to the God who is faithful. Who, Lord, help me in here today. I bet you your life and your day and your week will look differently if you gave the God of faithfulness the lion's share of the thoughts of your daily life. There, here, there, in, in Matthew, it records the encounter with Jesus and the legal, political, and cultural leaders of his day. We find in the Gospels that whenever Jesus is attempting to, to proclaim this ministry of the new and breaking kingdom or kingdom or way of life that is eternal in its nature and impact, you have people who are good meaning, well-intentioned folks, but too squarely grounded in their own kind of cultural and, 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 and historical reality to appreciate that something bigger and greater is now at their disposal. You have the Pharisees who were legal scholars committed to Mosaic laws and authority. You had the Sadducees who were more religious leaning and committed to priestly authority. You had the Her Herodians, who were likely a political party, who were seeking political independence from the empire of Rome. And they wanted to make sure they had a particular uh, leader from the, the lineage of the Her Her Herodian kind of tribes. And so you have all of these different kinds of groups, and they all agree on several things, one of which is Jesus is a threat to our political, cultural, religious, and legal projects. And so because he's a threat, I must, we must oppose him as often as we can so we can assure that our power and influence is maintained. But I want you to know, child of God, that it is never enough for good intentions to override the possibility of the new that God is bringing into our lives. Sure, these groups may have had good intentions, and I don't doubt they did. They, they may have had noble aims. I don't doubt the nobility of their efforts. But how many of you know that there are moments in life and moments in time when you are confronted with truth and with greater knowledge and revelation 
and wisdom, you must be humble enough to say that I will not allow my commitment to falsehoods or have truths to override the revelation that is being brought to me that can not only bless me, but everybody around me. I want you to know that the response of these Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians demonstrated that their, their pursuit of liberation caused them to lose the kind of loyalty that even they thought them themselves had to the people they were attempting to serve. Instead of embracing freedom that was standing before them, they conspired to trick and entrap and derail the ministry of Jesus so they can have their perceived or sometimes misperceived sense of importance. And this is the trap I see so many of us falling into in these times. We overestimate our importance. We overestimate our expertise to appeal to our rightly desired need for self-preservation and self-determination. But the trap, child of God, is when you think you are infallible with your limited information, your limited time and expertise. And then when you are confronted with someone or something greater than you, you think that you can punch above your weight, as they say, in the boxing space. <laughs> Amen. How many of you know in, in the boxing realm, it doesn't matter how good of a boxer you are, you can punch, you can meet a boxer who may not be as skilled, but because they are heavier and bigger and their reach is better, they will outdo and undo and neutralize your skill set. Well, hello, Ice Cube. Hello, Kanye. Hello, Candace Owens. Hello, evangelicals. Hello, neoliberals. Hello, every fundamentalist. And sometimes uh, some of us who are willfully or unaware of how we are being seduced by the Caesars all around us. We're being seduced because we think that we are important and we have a degree or we have celebrity or we have uh, some a semblance of influence that it all translates the same way everywhere you go. How many of you know that it don't translate equally everywhere you go? And this makes sense. How, how many of you know that you can be a millionaire? You can be a billionaire. But when your car breaks down, your millionaire and your billionaire sensibilities will not allow you to fix your own car. You will actually go to someone who makes less money than you, someone who is not living in as big a house as yours, someone who you may not know or hang out with, but when your car breaks down, you will give them the keys to your car. Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody in here. You'll give them the keys to your car and say, please help me fix what I don't understand. How is it that you can trust a trained a, a train mechanic with your car, but you will, you will trust an untrained uh, uh, politician with your future? You, you, you'll, you'll, you'll trust a trained uh, dentist with your mouth, but you'll trust an untrained preacher with your soul. You'll, you'll, you'll trust a, a, a doctor with your body, but you'll, you'll trust an untrained person with the things that matter to you the most, child of God. That's the first step that I want you to be mindful of as we understand these folk who aren't loyal to us. Number one, beware of the schemers. Somebody say, beware of the schemers. Yeah, beware of the schemers. Verse 15 says that the Pharisees and the Herodians went to plot and entrap Jesus by sending their disciples. All of these groups, they had tension with Jesus for various reasons, and their tension with Jesus caused them to respond, not with integrity, not with principled disagreement, but with schemes and dirty tricks. Uh, and I want you to know, child of God, people who are not loyal to you will handle you with manipulation and schemes to try and control or use you for their own purposes. Uh, they will try and, and, and make you believe that they are there with an olive branch, when in actuality, in their other hand, they have a knife and they have a trap that they are attempting to, to tie you up in. I want you to know that you and I must be skilled in being able to recognize the schemers. 
that show up in our lives. In our relationships, we must be careful to not see tension as an enemy, but rather the lack of integrity and in how we deal with tension is the enemy. Some of us, I'm one of them at times, I, 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 I bristle from when tension arises. Sometimes I shrink. Sometimes I swallow my tongue because I am, I am one of these folk who at times seeks to please people more than cause tension. But there are times when you push a brother too far. And then I forget about my people-pleasing sensibilities. Uh, and I got to tell you the truth, so help me to the Lord. And I want you to know that that is the integral response when you are in places of tension. Speak the truth in love. Create some spaces for honesty and tenderness and integrity. Even when we don't agree, you don't have to allow the kind of scheming and manipulating to overrun your life. No, take a stand and say this is not, uh, it is not contributing to the kind of formation into the image of God. But child of God, be wary of emissaries. Be wary of schemers that are sent on behalf of people you have tension with. You may call them gossipers. You may call them people who are just trying to get information and sow seeds. Uh, have you ever talked to somebody and you thought you were talking to them in confidence and all of a sudden when you talk to another person, you hearing the very same thing that you thought you shared in confidence? Be wary. <laughs> Them brothers ain't loyal, praise God. Uh -huh. You ought to be wary of the people who seek to sow seeds of discord in your relationships that are already rife with tension. Because they're not loyal to you. They're not loyal to the health of your, your relationships. They're not loyal to the life-giving trajectory of your existence. But also understand that even when we don't agree, we don't have to destroy one another. And I, 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 I found this point driven home most powerfully this week when I was interviewing Reverend Jesse Jackson for our Mass for the People show. And he talked about why voting is one of the greatest nonviolent tools to defeat our enemies. Because he says that we don't have to destroy our enemy when we're voting for them. We just really need to amass enough agreement among us and simply show up to defeat their ideas and remove them from power and lessen their influence in our daily lives without having to do things that literally cost them their lives. I found that to be a very fascinating take on the power of voting. That ideally, every few years, we have the opportunity to defeat those we disagree with, with principled, organized, and transparent means. Although we must tell the truth <laughs> that in this country throughout history, we've only seen that white men have had unfettered access to the franchise of voting. That every cent from the beginning, that they have seemingly been trying to keep uh, the, the, the le or they've been trying to make sure that the least amount of people can vote. That voting has never been fully available to everyone. And certainly we see in the rise of this current authoritarian political administration that the ways our current Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians are at work attempting to disrupt this election. But I want you to know, child of God, that the schemers won't win. The manipulators won't win. That even truth, as the scripture or as the, uh, the prophet says, even truth crushed to the ground will rise again. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I see myself rising. Now, I see myself rising from the ground that has attempted to crush me. And, 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 and I love it how, how they say that even if you have been buried, they didn't know you and I were seeds. They thought that it would destroy us. But in actuality, it is creating space for you and I to have. Have roots in the ground that will make me stronger than I was when I first hit the ground. Uh, how many of you can testify today that I'm stronger even though I'm on the ground? I find roots here now. Uh, I find strength here now. I find power that I didn't know existed before. Uh, uh, somebody holler, these bros, they not loyal, they not loyal. Child of God, the second thing that you and I must keep asking ourselves if we are going to be able to diagnose the disloyalty of this kind of sensibility around us, we must resist idolatry. Whew, Jesus, help us in here today. 
Uh, somebody holler, resist idolatry. Verse number 18 and 19, it says, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Jesus. Lord, I love this kind of Jesus, you know, because the kind of Jesus we like to talk about, Jesus never, you know, never raised his voice, you know. Jesus had a nice little perm, little baby, baby face, amen. Had a, had, had a nice little, you know, olive oil skin, like he went and got a manicure and a pedicure and a facial all the time, amen. He, his, his fingernails were nicely manicured, amen. Man, he had even a little gloss on, on the top of him, you know. He didn't have a blemish on his body. That's the Jesus we like to see. But I like the kind of Jesus that, you know, responds with a little oomph in his voice. Oh, you hypocrites. Why are you trying to put me to the test? Just make sure you channel a little Jesus everywhere you go. <laughs> Say praise God. Oh, help me, Lord. Amen. Jesus said, why are, you, why are you putting me to the test? Show me the coin that is used for taxes. Why? Because they were trying to entrap Jesus around his loyalty and the loyalty of the people who followed them. Should they be loyal to the emperor Caesar? Or should they be loyal to the law, to the Torah? And Jesus knows that their, their question, though valid, has uh, animus and, 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 and a lack of integrity in purpose and intent. And Jesus says, whose head is on this coin? Whose title is on this coin? They, of course, say Caesar. Jesus says, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar." and give to me or to God what is God's. Now, I could spend a whole lot of time talking about money and all kinds of things, about what Jesus is talking about, but I'd rather ask you a question when we're talking about the loyalty factor here. Because Jesus asks, whose face is on this coin? And I want to ask you, whose face is on your coin? The thing that you value, the thing that you hold high, who is your Caesar? And what belongs to this Caesar? This is an important question, which will speak to the crisis of discipleship that we have in this country. For hypocrisy is run amok both inside and outside the church. And if we keep it real, we all can display hypocrisy. We all can have contradictions. We all can be seduced by idolatry and arrogance, which produces lethal blind spots. Hypocrisy used in this story was an effort to entrap Jesus, but they did not know that in their effort to trap Jesus, they actually trapped themselves. And that's what arrogance and hypocrisy and idolatry will do. It will create such a huge blind spot for you that it will entrap the hypocrite long before the hypocrite is even aware they've been entrapped. Whew. Somebody holler, Lord, help me not to be a hypocrite. Amen. Help me because I, I, I'm not trying to be in no traps up in here. You know, I, 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 I got... I, I got this, uh, this, this, the, I, I, I hate bugs, you know, I'm not, a, that's why I don't go outside, I, I don't be out camping, praise God, sleeping on the ground, I don't believe in all that because I don't like bugs, I don't like critters, I don't like things flying by my face and in my nose and eyes and ears, I don't like none of that, amen, so whenever I see a bug in my house, I'm trying to kill that thing, Lord have mercy, I'm trying to make it pay for showing up in my space. Somebody, amen, shout amen. And then there, there are times where, you know, you use certain kinds of, 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 of spray, and, and, and they say when you spray the bug, the bug may take a, a deadly, it may die instantly, or it may take a little time. And, you know, I remember there was this bug, a big old water bug that used to make its way into uh, the place I was staying at during college. And I would spray that thing, and that thing would look at me, wave, smile, and keep on going. And I was like, oh, no, devil. No, you ain't, you ain't going to be down here where I'm trying to sleep. So I shake the can real good, and I spray it again. Shh. And the thing, it would slow down a little bit, but it, it would keep moving. And I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. I see you dying, but I'm going to make sure I give it to you one more time real, real good. I wish I had an a, a, a exterminator up in here to know what I'm talking about. I spread it again. Shh. Shh. Then that thing would stop moving. But, you know, the more I thought about it, the first time I hit that bug, with that lethal spray, that bug was dead and didn't even know it. 
It was a dead bug walking. <laughs> How many of you know that's what happens when our hypocrisy and our arrogance goes unchecked in our lives? We think that we are actually making progress, but we are nothing but a dead bug walking. And that's why the proverb writer says, there is a way that's right unto man, but the end is destruction. I find that this hypocrisy is showing up in so many ways that the intersection of greed and money, pride and inflated self-importance, and literally it is exposing idiocy all around us. Folk are proud and loud that they wrong. They can't even acknowledge, you know what, I think I got God. They don't even understand that their limited information when compared to the vast expertise they are engaging with should cause them to be more humble and less assured of their ignorance. But when you build an idol to the Caesar of self-importance, the Caesar of arrogance and power, you will think that your power will always trump with every pun intended the next power. But how many of you know the, the psalmist is right when the psalmist says that all power belongs to God? And that is why MLK captures so powerfully the recapitulated arguments of St. Augustine when he says that every true Christian is a citizen of two worlds the world of time and the world of eternity. And so although the Christian find themselves in the colony of time, their ultimate allegiance is to the empire of eternity. In other words, the Christian owes their ultimate allegiance to God. And if any earthly institution conflicts with God's will, it is, listen, the Christian duty to revolt against any such allegiance or institution. Now, the duty of the Christian to align with God's will over and against the kingdom of time can become a terrible self-delusion when done in service to Caesar or the empire. Because you have Christo-fascism arising, Christian nationalism rising up because you have some Christians in this country who believe that it is their duty to uh, support the genocide, the imperialism, the capitalistic, the militaristic, the racist and the human hierarchies of this American empire as a way to be faithful to God. But I want you to know they are not aware that they've traded in the God of history with the Caesar of their day. There are many who become zealous for all the wrong things and cause harm while attributing it to God. But how many of you know only violence belongs to Caesar as a tool for domination and compliance? God don't need violence in order for God's will to be done. God don't need you to use force in your relationships. Hello, Domestic uh, Violence Awareness Month. God don't need you to use the violence of words or actions, the manipulation or coercion in order to get up another human being that you are in a relationship with to bend to your will. That is Caesar. That's not God. And when you allow the violence of words or actions to secure victory, you have surrendered your loyalty. When you are complicit, naive, or blind to the violence of Caesar, your loyalty has been compromised. When you seek to rationalize the harm being done in the name of a cause at the expense of the vulnerable around you, your loyalty has been diminished. And I see a growing number of us, increasingly my fellow brothers, black folk, black men, these days getting caught up in the crosswinds of idolatry. Brothers that ain't never studied much, uh, ain't never been nowhere, ain't never sat and been taught anything, think they can look at YouTube uh, for 30 minutes a day and become as as educated as people who have spent their whole life learning and mastering a discipline. Now, I was talking to somebody and they I was hiring them for a job and it was so fascinating because although they're an expert in this one field, uh, I told them, you know, I'm hiring you because I believe you could do a better job at this than me. But how is it that you can't believe that someone can have a better informed opinion about science or politics or religion than you?
Have you studied politics? No, I'm not really into that. Have you studied science? No, I'm not into that. So you doubt the scientists. <laughs> you doubt the, the skilled, trustworthy politician. You don't believe in the religious preachers or teachers, but you are a master at holding a camera, and that now means that you are infallible in every other area of your life who hath bewitched you black man <laughs> to be so arrogant and make such reckless decisions some of us need to ask ourselves am i being loyal to the caesar of arrogance rather than surrendering myself to the wisdom of god made manifest through the history of trusted and loved individuals that have been put in my life as a compass this movement for independent thinking is nothing more than a shrine to some folks' egos. But I want to ask you, if you want to be an independent thinker, what guardrails do you have in place to keep your quest for truth and authenticity from becoming an exercise in immolated self-importance? Let me give you two quick things. Number one, you have a guardrail against this kind of idolatry by finding a community, listen, of intergenerational trusted experts or counselors and let them form you. Be willing to learn, this is the second thing, be willing to learn and say I'm sorry <laughs> and remain humble or else you will find Caesar taking root in your heart asking for a loyalty that they cannot return. Caesar, arrogance, power, dominion, violence, unaccountability will never give you what you are asking for, which is likely security, confidence, strength, power, self-determination. That's why this week some of us need to tell the Caesars in our life, the Caesars in our mind, the Caesars in our heart, the Caesars in our politics, the Caesars in our workplaces, you ain't loyal, bruh. So you can keep it. Keep everything you're trying to give me. Keep the simple-minded thinking. Keep the violence against the vulnerable. Keep the love of money and power and position. Keep all that stuff that contributes to me being deformed away from the image and likeness of Christ. And in return, child of God, embrace the loyalty of God. What is the Lord's, Jesus says. Obviously, this coin belongs to Caesar, but what is God asking of you and I? Jesus says, give to God what is God's. How many know the earth is the Lord's? and the fullness thereof. That means everything that is created is God's, and God deserves it. God is more than enough to deal and to handle all of the things that concern us. So give everything, somebody say everything, to God. Give God what belongs to him and let Caesar keep what belongs to him. It is a truth that the greatest thing Caesar can give you is only a material reflection of himself. But the greatest thing, Lord, I wish I had the voice and the energy to preach this like I feel it, that God can give you is an eternal, always transforming image of the uncreated one. That literally every day you live and every day you walk and breathe, God is giving you God's self. That imago dei, that's within every human being, that belongs to God. So give that back to God. That ability of God to turn nobody into somebody. That ability of God to turn the sick into the well. That ability of God to turn the defeated into an overcomer. God is loyal, but these bros over here, my friend, they not loyal. Caesar's not loyal. So don't give to God that which, or don't give to Caesar that which belongs to God, but discern and differentiate. 
God, I'm giving to you that which belongs to you. Come on, let's pray. God, I pray. I pray for the kind of discernment necessary to ensure that that which belongs to you, I and we gladly give to you. And that which belongs to Caesar, God, may we gladly give to Caesar. Knowing that Caesar is not loyal. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians in my life, they're not loyal. And so if they're not loyal, God, may I give to them the, the, the vices and the ways of being and the manipulations and schemes that, that they rightly deserve. And God, in return, may I always prioritize my loyalty to the faithfulness you have demonstrated. The way you continue to remind me and remind us that victory, strength, hope, and power, they all belong to you. And so, God, I, as I receive them, I in return give them back to you. Pray now, God, for the person who is listening to this message and finding themselves caught in dis or unloyal spaces and relationships. I pray, God, that they will be mindful, Lord God, that they can make a choice today, that they can indeed decide to give to you, God, a higher level of commitment, a level of commitment that is reflected in the way of Jesus, the way they live, the priorities they have, the, 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 the ways in which they continue to express their love for you and the things you love. I come against, Lord God, the ways in which we can easily be deceived or overtaken by arrogance or self-importance at the expense of those who we are called in this moment to love and to serve and to help. Lord, I pray, God, you will give us what we need to choose you every time and heal us, Lord God. Heal us from the harms and the pains of the disloyal bros around us, the disloyal systems, the disloyal ways of being. You may need to give your life to Jesus today. I just want to invite you to give your life to the most loyal, consistent, loving and free Savior you'll ever want to meet. Your life in the hands of Jesus is no better place to be. So God, we give our lives, our hopes, our dreams to you. Work in us, work through us. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way give God some praise and we say thank you, God.